Welcome to the Sydney Ball Lecture. My name is Bernard de Winghaus, and it's my pleasure as head of the Department of Social Policy and uh, Intervention to welcome you to the centenary Sydney Ball Lecture. The department dates back to June 1914, when Barnett House was founded at a meeting of social reformers in Sydney Ball's room at St. John's College. Their mission was to advance the systematic study of current social and economic questions. The lecture series thus dates back to 1920, commemorating the first chairman of Bonnet House, Sydney Ball, fellow of St. John's College. A century ago, the world had just survived the First World War and had experienced the Spanish influenza, a deadly pandemic at the time. 100 years ago, Oxford innovated by introducing the DPhil as a research degree, started the philosophy, politics, and economics, or PPE, undergraduate course, and became more inclusive. Indeed, Sidney Ball's progressive views in respect to the social question his efforts to opening up university education for the working class, for women in academia, and European ref refugees during the war have inspired many of his followers. Since the first lecture in 1920, several distinguished social policy advocates and great thinkers like John Maynard Keynes, Sidney Webb, or William Beveridge spoke on the social and economic problems of their time at Barnett House. The Department of Social Policy and Intervention stands in this tradition. It has evolved into a graduate department of the University of Oxford. It teaches international graduate students in two courses on comparative social policy and on evidence-based uh, social intervention and policy evaluation. And it is known for its research centers in the areas of social policy and social intervention. And uh, in 2020, we're today forced by the coronavirus pandemic to teach online and meet in the internet to pursue our goal to foster an academic learning and exchange across the Oxford community. So this provides us at least with the opportunity through the internet to welcome today a large online audience of our current students and departmental staff, but also many alumni and colleagues across the globe. Building on a century long history of engaging in considering social issues, we are very pleased to have a very distinguished speaker for this year's centenary ball lecture. Professor Peter Taylor Gooby from University of Kent. He will speak on the implications of the pandemic for the British welfare state. Peter has been a long-term friend and supporter of the department, and we are grateful to him that he will discuss with us this timely topic. Before my colleague, Mary Daly, Professor of Sociology and Social Policy in the department, will introduce our distinguished guest speaker. I would like to give the floor to the president of St. John's College, Professor Maggie Snowling, who has been supporting our lecture series in association with St. John's College. Please, Maggie. Thank you very much and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very proud to uh, be the co-host of this lecture, if it's possible to co-host a virtual lecture. And I'm very sorry indeed that I'm not able to invite you to St. John's College where we would normally uh, be meeting. As you've heard, Sidney Ball was a fellow of St. John's College and one whose distinction lived on for many years. And in fact, he is commemorated in our Canterbury Quadrangle. I'm particularly pleased today to be part of the centenary Sydney Ball Lecture, which is part of a more general celebration, perhaps, of the centenary of the PPE degree at Oxford, which, of course, also coincides with another centenary 
the centenary of admitting women to Oxford for degrees. The legacy of Sydney Ball at St John's is perhaps not in the field of social policy, but it lives on in our interests in equity in education. And as everyone here knows, social and educational disadvantage are inextricably linked. Moreover, the social gradient that we know exists in educational attainment is almost certainly to have been magnified by the pandemic. At our college, we are committed to access to higher education and through our Inspire Outreach programmes, we aim to enable young people to aspire to higher education and indeed to Oxbridge. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what Professor Taylor Goodby has to say this evening. And so with no further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Daly. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie and Bernard. Um, welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Peter Taylor Gooby, who is Professor of Social Policy at the University of Kent. He is a towering presence in British social policy and also in comparative social policy more broadly. I think it's fair to say he was a comparativist before it became fashionable. He honed his social policy knowledge and expertise over a long period and in a number of different institutions. After completing his education in social policy at the universities of Bristol, Kent and York, Professor Taylor Gooby started his lecturing career at the University of Manchester before joining the University of Kent in 1979 as a lecturer in social policy. His subsequent long and established career has seen him hold a professorship in social policy at Kent for 30 years. His contributions are both theoretical and empirical. In the former regard, for example, Professor Taylor Gooby is one of the primary theorists of the new social risks perspective, which has become an important explanation of growth and change in welfare states. And it takes the idea of the changing portfolio and nature of risks, especially those in private life, including, for example, the breakdown of relationships, the growth of lone parenthood, changes in fertility, and theorizes these as both major challenges to, but also driving forces for welfare reform. I must say that I am of the view that this theoretical perspective could well be employed to good use for the analysis of social policies, uh, responses to COVID-19, because I think what we are seeing is two tectonic shifts coming together. On the one hand, a profound change in both the nature of and relative exposure to social and economic risk. And on the other hand, a privatization of many of these risks with, for example, families and private relationships accepted, expected to absorb many of the costs of the policies that we're introducing for the pandemic. People working in the fields on which we teach and research in this department will either already know of Professor Taylor Gooby's work, or will it encounter it quite quickly once they enter the field. As well as the new social risks theorization, Professor Taylor Gooby has written some of the most important work on attitudes to and preferences for welfare, exploring the political legitimacy of the welfare state and contributing to our knowledge of how one makes a case for the welfare state as public opinion and political attitude shift. Another important topic on which he has contributed foundational insights is austerity as a social policy mode and its consequences for collective well-being, social divisions, and social justice. In fact, when I look at Peter Taylor Gooby's work, I am really struck by how much it has shaped guiding debates in the literature, and also by how much of what we know about welfare state change comes from him. As well as um, academic, or in, in partly uh, due to his academic work, he has led numerous research projects, many of them across university, both nationally in the UK and also in an EU and OECD context. As well as theoretical rigor, his work breaks new ground methodologically. His projects are always notable for the diversity and strength of their evidence base and their mixed methods approaches. 
and he regularly challenges us with papers with such titles as how good is social policy research question mark. At the last count, he has written 28 academic books, over 140 articles, more than 130 chapters in academic books, and he has given more than 100 keynote presentations at international conferences. Having become increasingly dissatisfied with the weaknesses of social science in addressing the emotions and presumptions that so strongly influence people's behavior, he is turning to writing novels. At the time of writing, or at the time of uh, up to today, I believe, he has written three novels thus far. The first entitled Ardent Justice, the second The Baby Auction, and the latest one is entitled Blood Ties. As you might expect, he has received wide recognition for his work in academic circles, but also more broadly. He has been made a fellow of both the British Academy and the Academy of Social Sciences, and actually the latter academy he was a founding member of. More broadly, he was appointed um, an officer of the Order of the British Empire, OBE, for services to social science in 2012. And he has also been honored by the UK Social Policy Association for his contribution to the discipline of social policy. These and other prizes and accolades recognize such leadership on his part as chairing the social work and social policy panel for the research excellence framework in 2014 and also chairing that same panel for the previous exercise, the research assessment exercise as, as it was called in 2008. Professor Taylor Gooby is a scholar who seeks actively to participate in public debate and also in policy making. He is well known in policy circles and has participated in some very high level policy endeavors at prime ministerial level. It will be obvious, I hope, that his work is in the tradition of Sydney Ball and the Barnett House emphasis on the importance of the study of contemporary social and economic problems the need to think creatively, but also critically about social reform, and the need for us all to commit to giving the study of social and economic problems a central place in the university, whether at Oxford or beyond. So we look forward very much to your lecture, Peter, and are honored to have you give this centenary Sydney Ball lecture. Thank you very much. That's a, a very generous um, introduction. Uh, some of you will be thinking about starting out on PhDs, I suspect. And uh, one hint I can uh, suggest is that in my career, I think I got very interested in attitudes and public opinion at an early stage. And that's great because people have attitudes to almost anything. And attitude research is an excellent way of examining all sorts of issues in society. It takes you in all sorts of directions. So really, that's my background. And then it takes you to comparative research, to looking at political discourse, and to looking at all sorts of aspects of social policy. Let me move on now to the lecture. I, the title, as you see on the screen, is Where Next for the Post-Pandemic Welfare State? I don't know even when the pandemic is going to come to an end, let alone what exactly the challenges to the welfare state will be and how we can resume how we can address them. I don't know what resources will be available and how government will be tackling them. So beyond the generalities that we will certainly face a scarred generation, as Professor Scholing pointed out, the people who face the challenges of trying to get a job, trying to complete their education at this stage. Although we know that a large number of our welfare services 
were shown to be seriously wanting by the crisis, healthcare, particularly social care, a lot of problems we've experienced in local government uh, and in the benefit system and other areas. Although we've identified many areas of inequality, I don't have anything very original to say about those issues. But I do have some points about the future that we will face. And I'll move on to consider those in a moment. But first, Sydney Ball. Sydney Ball was a prominent member of the Fabian Society. He was one of the co-founders of the Oxford branch of the Society. In 1896, he joined the National Society based in London. In 1907, he was elected to the executive supported by H.G. Wells. Many people see the particular brand of socialism pursued by Fabians as underlying much of the welfare state. Fabianism is a gradual approach to socialism through constitutional parliamentary means. It concentrates on social reforms and believes those will add up to a better society. And in 1896, the year that he joined the London Fabian Society, Dr. Ball published a pamphlet, a Fabian pamphlet entitled The Moral Aspects of Socialism. And I suspect he was addressing some of his fellow Fabians in that pamphlet. He makes a distinction. He talks about empirical social reform, improvements designed to eradicate some of the evils of contemporary society. And a lot of what we see as state welfare could come under that heading. But he also emphasizes something else. He emphasizes collectivism and what he sees as the moral sentiments of socialism, a wider sense of public duty and responsibility. And he sees that as the goal of reform. So he sees the future as not only requiring empirical social reform, but also the idea of a direction for that reform, a direction that we might see as solidarity or social cohesion. And he is very much concerned in that pamphlet to attack what he sees as individualism and competition. Now, Fabianism, often seen as related to the welfare state. In terms of empirical social reform, we've certainly had an enormous amount of reform since Sydney wrote. This graph illustrates that. It looks at spending on the main areas of welfare, education, health, pensions, family, unemployment, one could add in a bit of uh, housing, I suppose, uh, but I haven't done so uh, because spending in that area is so fitful. And it shows an increase in spending, massive increase in the proportion of our gross domestic product devoted to those services. So the welfare state in terms of empirical social reform is a success story. A few hiccups when there are world wars, or Thatcherism, and of course, an increase on the graph when GDP plummeted at the height of the recession. And now, not necessarily a happy time for empirical social reform, but state of welfare is much more expansive than it was when Sydney wrote. But we can look at the other aspects of welfare. How united is our society? To what extent are we all in the same boat? We can consider equality. My next PowerPoint looks at income inequality. And this is just over a relatively brief period. This starts in 
in the mid 90s goes up to nearly the present day. And it looks at equality and inequality between fifths of the population. The blue line is the richest fifth and it goes down to the poorest fifth of the population. And this illustrates what you might see as the fanning out, the greater divergence of income in our society during the last generation. We have become a more unequal society in terms of incomes. And how's that related to the welfare state? Well, looking at the bottom end of poverty, and this is over a rather longer period because I'm able to get reliable data back over that period to the 60s, so it's 60 years covered there. We can see a story of progress. The orange line represents pensioners and represents the proportion of pensioners whose incomes fell below a measure of a poverty line, 60% of contemporary median income after housing costs, shows that in the early 60s, more than 40% of pensioners fell below that line. And over the last 60 years, there have been hiccups and variations, but in general, the trend has been downwards. And pensioners, because there are so many of them, are far and away the biggest group in poverty. So that's a success story. We've more than halved poverty among pensioners. But look at the other lines. The blue line is children. And among children, poverty has increased, particularly in the 80s and early 90s. It's declined a little bit since then, but not massively. And over the whole period, poverty among children is round about twice what it was at the beginning. Poverty among children has doubled. The other lines refer to the parents, adults in families with children and non-parents, adults without children. And you can see there have been increases, but less marked. It remains the case that although the gap between pensioners and the rest of the population is now narrower, that gap has been reversed and we treat pensioners rather better, which is a nice thing. There are more of them perhaps, but we teach, we treat our children very badly indeed in terms of poverty. It is not a good idea to bring up nearly a third of the children in society in poverty. So when we start looking at the details and we start looking at issues of equality and collectivism, the welfare state isn't such a success story. Here's another way of looking at it. This is recent government spending. And crudely, it's spending on old and young. The blue line represents spending on pensions and health care. And roughly three quarters of healthcare spending goes on older people. So that's a proxy for spending on older people. The orange line, the lower line, is spending at younger age groups, education and various aspects of welfare, particularly welfare benefits for those groups. The point I'm making is this, that the lines diverge about 10 years ago and over the last decade, spending on old and young has separated. I'm moving towards a position that says, although we've had a great deal of empirical social reform, we've not necessarily moved towards Dr. Ball's second goal, the goal of greater collectivism, a moral sense of welfare, a sense of social cohesion. And in recent years in particular, the government has played a role through welfare policies, through its social reforms, in exacerbating those divisions. Another way of looking at it is to look at how we treat jobless people, unemployed people at the bottom of the income distribution, those of working age, of course, 
And this line shows you replacement rates, the proportion of a person's previous income that benefits will make up. So you can get an idea of the gap between the working class in work and those out of work. And the point it makes is this is a particular uh, example, single person on two thirds of average wage. So not well off to start with. But over the last 20 years, the replacement rate, the standard of living that they could command compared to a member of the working class in work has fallen sharply. The division between jobless people and those in work, as politicians often like to call them, hardworking families, has grown wider. And these aspects of inequality are mirrored in complicated ways in other divisions in our society. We look at gender issues. Women, for women in full-time work, the pay gap with men has shrunk over the last couple of decades. In fact, it's nearly halved uh, from about 17% uh, of women's wages to about 8%. But for women in part-time work, and that's substantial numbers, it's hardly changed at all. And for that, women in lower skilled jobs, uh, particularly in areas like social care, hospitality, uh, pubs, restaurants, uh, or in retail, in shops, it's actually grown slightly wider. And it's grown rather more, rather more among older groups of women. And the reasons for this are complex, but levels of skill and also the importance of part time working and balancing life and work and the demands of dependence. And also the cost of childcare in the UK. Remember, childcare in the UK is the most expensive in Europe, according to OECD. Must play a part. And these aspects of poverty accumulate and intersect in complex ways. Looking at ethnic minorities, some ethnic minorities, particularly those of African, Pakistani, Bangladeshi origin, experience much higher levels of poverty than the population at large, roughly half as high again. Again, in the UK, we have large regional inequalities. The ONS's most recent uh, comparison of inequalities between the North East and London indicated that in the North East, disposable incomes were round about two thirds of what they were in London. Or to look at it another way, in London on average, they're half as much again as they are in the North East. And that's striking, but perhaps it's not that fair a comparison because London is, after all, unusual, biggest city in Europe uh, and has its own economy. But if you compare the Northeast with another region, the Southeast, the Southeast living standards are on average about a third higher than in the Northeast. These are very large gaps and they're gaps that have been growing and that accumulate and interact and intersect with some of the other issues. And to sum all this up, the kind of society we're moving towards is one in which government plays a role in generating divisions between social groups. And it's the way we organize our social welfare policies that plays a part in that. And the two aspects of Sidney Ball's reforms interact with each other. But we've had an enormous amount of empirical social reform but the question we need to ask is how successful has that been in achieving the end of social cohesion? And I believe that greater equality must play a role in that.
Well, another way to look at it is, is to consider how we think about these issues. And remember, I like looking at people's attitudes, but at the same time, I'm rather dissatisfied with conventional methods of looking at attitudes because I've spent a lot of my time looking at surveys like British Social Attitudes Survey or the European Social Survey. And I always feel that for the individual sitting there answering questions on a computer screen or with an interviewer coming and knocking on their door, well, you do tend to think up answers to questions you've never really thought about. And you do like to come out on rather the positive side of any issues. So it's not clear that the answers you're getting are going to give you an accurate picture of society. Some other things, these are some faces you might recognize, recent British prime ministers. And here are some quotations. What they're saying in the area of equality. And it doesn't matter very much which quotation goes with which face. I mean, you could, there are differences, obviously, and very substantial differences in the policies that these individuals advocated. But when they talk about equality, they tend to slide into a language of opportunity. They tend to understand equality in terms of equality of opportunity rather than equality of outcome, to put it in simple jargon. They tend to emphasize what is often seen as a meritocratic approach, though they don't always use that language. And the approach, the discourse that comes to us top down, and presumably it comes top down because politicians believe it will echo and resonate with attitudes in the population at large, is one in which it's opportunities that are valued. And this fits with research I did recently using democratic forums, large groups of people who meet for two or three days. When I say large, I mean 30 or 40, to discuss social issues. And we try to conduct them with the minimum of interference or supervision or mentoring from a chair so that it's people's attitudes untrammeled by academic ideas that tend to come out. And you do get a very strong enthusiasm for opportunity and for education reforms, particularly that lead to opportunity. When you just ask people like that to talk about how they'd like the welfare state to develop. And that's interesting. And it's something that's particularly striking in the UK compared to other European countries we use the same method in. So I'm suggesting that the interpretation of equality in terms of opportunities to seize positions in an unequal society, rather than to achieve equal outcomes, is something that our prime ministers are seizing on and emphasizing because it's something that's there in the general population. The other issue I mentioned, of course, is about employment and unemployment. And looking at attitudes in that area, there's a great deal to be said. Our participants in the democratic forums, some of whom were unemployed themselves, but only a minority because we tried to represent the population at large, were very much concerned about unemployed people. And they were concerned that government treated unemployed people too softly and gave them too much. And that's mirrored in the kinds of views you find in social surveys like British social attitudes. And that is, I think, probably the premier social survey in the UK at present with the highest standards and the most expensive to conduct and a relatively large sample. And this graph shows you a couple of questions, the answers to them from their surveys over the last two decades. And the questions are about benefits for unemployed people. 
And the orange line is those who agreed that benefits are too high and likely to damage work incentives. The blue line is people who took the opposite view, you might see, or the contrary view, that the benefits are too low and likely to cause real hardship. You can see how those lines diverged during up to uh, the time of the Great Recession, that there are more and more people thinking benefits were too high. But more recently, that group has tended to decline. And the proportion thinking benefits are too high was roughly nearly halved. Whereas people are thinking they're too low, that attitude has become more prevalent in the population. So maybe, although we do tend to stigmatize unemployed people and the benefits we give them are relatively low and have declined in recent years, there's some indication of a possible change. A change in a direction of which Sidney Ball would approve. Well, that's really talking about background. Now we come to COVID-19. and The pandemic is, of course, a terrible thing. It has been responsible for the deaths of very many of our fellow citizens, and it's caused misery, poverty, insecurity for very many others. I wonder sometimes if there's a shade or a glimmer of something positive coming out of it, at least in the way that Sidney Ball, I think, might understand it. And here is Johnson announcing the first lockdown on the 23rd of March this year. And he emphasized the theme that we're all in it together. And that's a theme, I think, that resonated with many people. Even prime ministers, even Prince Charles can catch the pandemic. And they both caught it in early April. And we all remember, I think, the NHS rainbows that appeared in very many windows, the clapping on doorsteps on Thursday afternoon to applaud essential workers, health service workers, care workers, workers in shops and in transport and so on. And for the first time since the Second World War, we had a definition of essential workers. And they're mainly people in low paid, insecure work, but they were being honored by the public. And that's a reversal of the normal approach, which is to pass by on the other side for such groups. There was an explosion of volunteering. The National Health Service put out an appeal for volunteers. It hoped to get perhaps a quarter of a million in a couple of weeks. And that's a big number. And the volunteers would transport me medicines, get prescriptions for people who are shielding themselves at home, uh, befriend people, and so on. And local authorities also put out an appeal for volunteers, hoping to get roughly the same number. And again, that's befriending people, taking food parcels to them, and other basic duties to help the most vulnerable people who are isolated at home. And both those appeals generated three times the expected number within a shorter time period, within 10 days. And that is a very substantial demonstration through people's actions of their sympathy with other people, their compassion, their goodwill, their neighbourliness, whatever you want to call it. And I might want to call it greater solidarity in the face of the pandemic. And we can find a lot of survey evidence. Office for National Statistics, Opinion and Lifestyle Survey, which is a very large attitude survey, reports over half of adults felt a greater sense of belonging with other residents in their local community. Over two thirds believe people are doing more to help others. Over half said that they'd helped their neighbours. 
62% uh, said they'd gone shopping uh, for other people, done other tasks for neighbours, and so on. And there are surveys by Demos, uh, the Young Foundation, some work by Public Health England that shows almost exactly the same thing. So, and also there's an unprecedented burst of public spending, uh, probably adding up to something like 340 billion by the end of the year, a third of a trillion pounds. Though unclear at present as we move into the second lockdown and the second stage of, ex of substantial demands on the public purse. And most of that money went in grants and loans to business of various kinds. Uh, they add up altogether to about 330 billion. Though, of course, some of that will be recovered from the loans. And of course, there are a range of tax concessions that have mainly affected business, VAT, local authority rates, and so on. But benefit reforms were initially very generous. They add up to something like over, well, 54 billion for the first lockdown and a little while after it for the furloughing scheme, the job retention scheme, which paid salaries or contributed to paying salaries for employees whom their employers retained in work rather than making them redundant because of the recession. For small business, something like 30 billion in loans and grants. And for people on universal credit, the bottom increases in universal credit and some relaxation of some of the harsh restrictions, but not all of them on the benefit, about 10 billion. So there's survey evidence that we've moved into a phase of greater public sympathy for those in need for vulnerable people. And that's a shift, really, in the tradition of ideas about welfare. Well, I want to pursue that in a little bit more detail. And I'll do that by looking at food banks. Food banks, very simple institutions. They're local, they're neighbourly and informal. They're people setting up an organisation which collects food one way or another. Often you see collection points in supermarkets asking people to put a tin of baked beans in or something like that when they go shopping uh, and um, distributes that to families in need. Food banks expanded massively in the past decade. There were, they gave out about a third of a million meals in 2010. By 2017, that had expanded to about 10 million, grown by 30 times. The Trussell Trust, the biggest organisation networking in this area, has about 1,400 food banks included. And there are probably another 800 or so outside the Trust, though it's difficult to get very good statistics. Well, I'm interested in food banks because they're local, they're relatively informal, they're an expression of goodwill by people in their local area. They have a very good public image. Over a third of people report giving to food banks in the last year, and most people think they're a good thing. They're imperfect, coverage is patchy. They're not necessarily as effective at serving some ethnic minority groups as serving the majority population. But looking at food banks, one way into generosity there is to look at crowdfunding appeals. I expect you're familiar with crowdfunding uh, organisations like Just Giving, GoFundMe or Virgin Giving provide internet platforms on which people can set up very simple, very simply and easily appeals for donations for a whole range of things. But some of those appeals are for food banks. And it's possible to take data from those websites and look at the trajectory of appeals over time. And that's what I do in the next slide. This 
is covering the period of the first lockdown. And I'm interested in these appeals because they are an expression of spontaneous generosity. They cover local people setting up an appeal. They're typically small scale. The average size of the appeals uh, there is raise about 1,500 um, pounds in my data set. They're usually short lived. They last from four to six weeks. But here, and perhaps I'd better explain what I've got because it's not immediately obvious, but I like it, is infections, the blue line. And you can see from the beginning of March this year, as we move towards the lockdown on the 23rd of March, the number of cases increased very rapidly, tailing off, plateauing round about the beginning of April through May, and then starting to decline, thank goodness, into June. And then we had a relatively messy withdrawal from the lockdown when government attempted to, uh, to make it compulsory to return to school rather, ineffective, rather ineffectually for students, uh, attempted to restart travel and business and employment, but finally succeeded as we moved into July and the number of cases declined. People setting up food bank appeals followed that and the trajectory rises with a bit of a hiccup round about Easter. But then it reaches a peak at the beginning of May and then it declines too, following the trajectory of infections. And I find that interesting because if you want a measure of need, quite a good one that you can get access to over time is the numbers on universal credit. And that's the black line. And this is the increase. It's set to zero. Of course, there are over a million people on universal credit uh, for other reasons at the beginning of March. But it's the increase that you might reasonably attribute to COVID. And of course, there are other people who are in poverty and need who are not necessarily on universal credit. There are about 300,000 uh, uh, applications in this period that were turned down and so on. But it, it's a measure. And of course, as you can see, in order to fit everything on the same graph, I put the uh, I divided the weekly infections by 100 and the number, the increase in universal credit by 10,000. So we've got nearly two and a half million on universal credit by the beginning of June, uh, whereas the numbers of appeals go up to about 450 and the numbers of cases go up to 30,000. But it's the shape of those lines of that graph that I want to draw your attention to. And that's the shape of people's neighbourliness during COVID, during the first lockdown. Perhaps we can take that a bit further forward. I'm sorry, it's difficult to get the data completely up to date, but the graph I've just shown you on the previous slide takes you up to the 1st of July, round about here, this kind of cutoff point. But now we're looking at the situation up to the beginning of November, up to very recently. And you can see that food bank appeals, sorry, you can see that COVID cases, the blue line, remained low through the summer. That's the time that we had reintroduction of travel, then restrictions on travel, particularly international travel. Uh, we had local lockdowns in Leicester, then in various cities in the northeast and the northwest in Scotland. Uh, we had particular restrictions in Wales. And finally, we moved into a national lockdown in early uh, November. And of course, cases were increasing. And of course, the numbers of cases at this stage is not directly comparable to the numbers of cases during the first lockdown, 
because our technology for tracing cases had improved very substantially over that period. But it's the shapes of the graph I want to draw to your attention. The numbers on universal credit increased slightly. It certainly did not go down over the summer. Unfortunately, you can only get figures up to the end of September, but I doubt very much whether it's declined since. And I think it's extremely likely it will have risen as we move into lockdown and as many people are thrown out of work. But food bank appeals have picked up a bit. Uh, they picked up to roughly half the level that they were during the first lockdown. And now they seem to be declining. It'd be lovely to know where they're going next. The point I want to make out of this is that somehow we had this outburst of generosity and it's some enabliness. And for me, that's summed up in people setting up appeals for local food banks to help their neighbours in need. A bit of community goodwill or social cohesion, as you might think of it. But that's fallen away and it doesn't respond to the level of need. If you think of need as people on universal credit, which I think is not an unreasonable way of looking at it, universal credit, I should say, is the last resort social security benefit in the UK, means tested benefit for people who have no other resources. So, and generosity, so far as we can see, does not seem to be returning. In other words, in Sidney Ball's language, we had massive empirical social reform. And perhaps for a period, we did achieve some kind of cohesive solidarity, a caring response to need that Sidney Ball also valued. But somehow it went away and it doesn't seem to be coming back. Here's some more evidence. This whoops, is a slide, I can find it. All right, found it, uh, about the sense of solidarity, and it's an official ONS um, opinion and lifestyle survey, large sample survey, good quality data. And it's based on two questions they ask over the period of the first lockdown, 24th of April, 21st of May, and 25th of June. And the blue lines represent answers to a question do you think Britain was more united before the lockdown than it is now? And you can see that's a relatively small group, starting off around about 20%, going up to about 25% of those asked. But the second question is about what you think about the future. Do you think Britain will be more united after the pandemic than it is now? What kind of experience of social cohesion and solidarity do you look forward to? At the beginning of the lockdown or towards the beginning, that's a relatively large proportion, getting on for 60%. But over time, that proportion declines. Unfortunately, they haven't asked the question since. I'd love them to do that, uh, but they don't seem keen to do so. Uh, but that, to me, is an indication of a declining anticipation of solidarity and social cohesion. So there's something we lost, and why did we lose it? Well, one answer, and perhaps you can think of three kinds of answers, is compassion fatigue, a general sense of gloom reinforcing it. People just feel worn out by the pressures on them. They don't have the energy to care about other people. And of course, we faced very large recession, perhaps going up to 12% of GDP by the end of the year, as OBR predicts. We have high unemployment, now up to 7.5% and going up higher steadily. We have huge pressure on public finances and we have the awareness at some stage, we're going to have to pay for it. 
We have increasing poverty. National Institute of Economic and Social Research estimates rough doubling in poverty over uh, 2020. And we may not make up the lost output for a couple of years till 2022. At least that's the Office of Budgetary Responsibility's most recent prediction. And then, of course, on top of it, we have the unknown of Brexit at Christmas. But few people seem to think that that's going to be positive for our economic situation, at least in the short term. So it's reasonable to suggest that compassion fatigue is part of this. I want to suggest a couple of other explanations. One has been the quality of government, the flirtation with herd immunity and the delay in setting up the first lockdown, the problems with supply of ventilators, protective equipment, the closure and then the re-establishment of a testing and contact tracing system, treatment of those in care homes and their staff, uh, the problems with all with getting adequate data on cases, tests, and even number of deaths due to coronavirus, uh, problems about the success of tests, the issue of awarding of contracts to private organisations with little or no experience in the areas they were expected to provide uh, emergency services in, and so on. And we've had various difficulties in government managing the end of the first lockdown, finally coming to a decision to impose the second lockdown. We've had all the problems negotiating with local government in areas that were locked down in the period between those dates and the delays and U-turns, the campaigns around free school meal led by Marcus Rashford. And it all adds up to the third highest death toll from the disease in Europe behind only Belgium and Spain. And probably the deepest recession in Europe, at least according to the EU. So you can understand why there's a concern about how solidaristic we're going to be when we face delay, indecision and lack of leadership. And that can be illustrated by a standard measure of approval of government. This is from YouGov, all the uh, market research agencies ask similar questions. It's just, do you approve of the government or not? You can see that approval, the blue line, started off at a fairly low level, 20% roughly, in November 2019. It rose after the election, of course, and generally governments get a honeymoon period. People have voted for them, the majority, and people like them. And that happened here. And approval continued to rise gently. Then at the beginning of the pandemic, the sense of solidarity, at the beginning of the lockdown, it rose very rapidly, but then it declined at the period when the number of cases was plateauing. And then as the number of cases fell and as government seemed more indecisive and problematic, it fell further and has continued to decline gently ever since. And of course, there's one event I haven't mentioned that took place round about here, 22nd of May, which is a revelation in newspapers that uh, the senior advisor to the Prime Minister, uh, Dominic Cummings, had made an ill-advised trip against the regulations uh, to Durham and to Barnard Castle. And that was something that media seized on and was very widely seen as evidence of one law for one group and one law for the rest of us. And that really goes on to the third reason, the realisation that we're not actually all in this together. And there's many indications of that. Living standards are unequal between those on the job retention scheme, on the furlough scheme, where for an average worker, the furlough repayment gives an income of about 90% of what they earned. 
relatively reasonable income, and very generous for a British welfare scheme. But for those who lose their jobs and have to depend on universal credit, and many of these are people who never thought they would go near a universal credit last resort welfare office in their lives, for them, living standards fall to about half for an average worker that they would get in work, a very substantial impact. And we look at the impact of the pandemic and of lockdown one on various groups for ethnic minorities, nearly over a fifth, nearly a quarter in fact, lost jobs after the first lockdown, according to Resolution Foundation, as opposed to just over 10% of the population at large. For younger workers, it's again nearly 20% for those 18 to 24, the scarred generation, self-employed, something like 30% of those report having no income during the lockdown. Lockdown bore very heavily on women workers who are often having to manage uh, dependents and manage children as well. There were major regional inequalities and generational inequalities. So experience of not being all in it together. But now we're moving towards lockdown too. And COVID is a terrible thing. There is a glimmer of hope and that glimmer is that this time we might manage it a bit better. And there are all sorts of things that we can think of and other people have expressed this very much better than I have. But briefly, we can think immediately of moving towards a regime which gives greater equality in benefits and removes some of the sanctions and limitations and caps in universal credit so that living standards of those forced to depend on that are rather closer to the population work and the rest of the population. In the future, we can think of the importance of education and training. And as everybody understands, this is for a particular generation that will be affected over much of their working lives. And we need in work retraining. We need a very substantial expansion of the kickstart scheme which sort of follows on from Labour's uh, future jobs scheme and we need other job schemes particularly schemes that make it attractive for employers to take on people and integrate training through our further education system and all that will cost a lot of money of course. In the longer term future we need to overhaul our social care system for frail elderly people, which has become fragmented under private ownership and proved very difficult to coordinate and offers very differing standards. We need to think about a national child care service and a way of subsidising that so we bring down the costs of child care. We need to have a higher living wage. And there are many other things we need to do as well. But I haven't really got anything particularly original to say about those things. And there are a couple of other points I do want to stress that I don't see emphasised so much elsewhere. And that is, if we want to move in the directions that Sydney Ball valued, if we want to build on empirical social reform and create a society which is more cohesive and more sharing, and more equal, and more generous, we need reforms which bear on people's experience of solidarity in their everyday lives. So much of our lives now are about competition and individualism about succeeding better than others in an unequal society. And that becomes more and more important as the incomes available at different levels fan out. We need something that doesn't make competitiveness and individual achievement the basis of everything. But it's difficult to think of where we go. But one area we need 
I think, is a return to greater importance for trade unions and greater, stronger rights for trade unions so that people can have the experience of collective action in their workplace. We need more industrial democracy so that business is not controlled simply by the profits available to shareholders. We need a banking system that backs that up. We need more local democracy and real local democracy with reasonable about amounts of money and reasonable local control over a whole range of issues, planning, transport, uh, business location, etc. We need those kinds of things. And we need to move towards a world which has greater solidarity. My second thought, and it's really my final thought, it's really about what we must not do. And we must not manage the huge public debt which we will incur, and the budgetary deficits, as we did those rather smaller deficits over the past decade. The past decade was one of austerity in the UK, as in many countries. This slide is based on work by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which looks at the impact of tax and benefit reforms over the last decade. And it gathers together and accumulates the impact of those reforms on different income groups. And it divides the population up into tenths, the poorest tenth number one on the left, second poorest number two, third poorest number three, and so on, up to the richest tenth of the population, 10, on the right-hand side. And the bars represent different population groups, blue bar working age families with children, green bar working age adults without children, so that's the working age, and the orange bar, shorter bars, represent old age pensioners, and the scale measures the impact in income terms on those groups in percentages of their original income. And what this shows, of course, is that the tax and benefit reforms taken together fall most harshly on working age people with children. As we've seen, it's among children that we've had an increase in poverty and a striking increase in poverty. And of course, the poorest group, most of them won't actually be in work or only working, only peripherally attached to the labour market. So it's benefit reforms that have hit them hardest. The poorest have lost round about 20% of their previous income as a result of all these reforms. Adults without children, about half that. Pensioners in the poorest group, much less. And in fact, overall, the impact had much of the reforms has been much less on pensioners. But we can see that those tax and benefit for reforms have penalised the weakest and most vulnerable. And we must be careful, whatever we do, not to reproduce that. And that's why it's extremely unhelpful that the Chancellor at the Conservative Party conference on 5th of October emphasised that the government has a sacred responsibility to balance the books for future generations, as he put it. And the government does have that responsibility, but it is one among a number of priorities, looking after the most vulnerable members of the population and trying to achieve greater social cohesion, I would argue, is more important. So I've reviewed briefly developments in the welfare state round about the time of COVID. I've argued that the welfare state has been a success story. Huge amount of social reform, reductions in poverty. But in recent years, we've got greater inequality and possibly increases in poverty for some groups and some of the most vulnerable groups. And government policies on benefits and in other areas 
have driven some of those divisions. And that's something that Sidney Ball would not have approved of, I think. And then more recently, COVID has produced an explosion of social cohesion and generosity during the first lockdown, but somehow we've lost that. So the challenge is to get that back. Thank you very much. I think that's enough from me.